Okay, welcome back everyone to Grockets OGTV. This is actually, I believe, the 40th broadcast in this series, and we are just now today starting the reading comprehension section of the official guide. So that is the official guide to the GMAT, the 12th edition, <clears throat> like it says in the lower left-hand corner there. And we are going through the, the book uh, question by question, uh, cover to cover, and um, doing each of the questions. So we're, we're just starting on a new section, and we are on uh, page 358, which is the beginning of the sample reading comprehension questions. And of course, reading comprehension works differently um, not only on the GMAT, but also on this broadcast. Uh, so the assumption is that you do have the book in front of you. I'm not going to sit here and read every reading comprehension passage to you because it's reading comprehension, not listening comprehension. Um, uh, by the same token, I do want this to work equally well if you are um, doing this kind of live, you know, in the same time frame that I'm doing it, as well as working on your own. <laughs> So let's talk about that a little bit. And of course, the way it's different on the test is, is that you get this one passage, and then you will get a number of questions on that same passage after it. So you have, unlike other question types on the exam, you have a large initial time investment where you will spend four, four and a half minutes, um, maybe even five minutes, depending on the length of the passage, um, reading it, um, understanding it, taking notes if you are so inclined. I usually take some very brief notes, um, in part because I read relatively quickly, uh, but also I really feel like it helps me um, uh, solidify my ideas about what the passage is about. It also keeps me from going too far in the passage, uh, quote-unquote spaced out, you know, uh, where if you, you know, the GMAT's a long exam, you know, you could be there for four hours, um, and if you you know, read for too too long, you know, and you just sort of read through the whole thing, you can get to the end of the whole passage and realize that you read the whole thing and not really rem remember anything that you just read. So stopping after each paragraph in particular to make a few brief notes is one way to prevent that um, spacing out from going on too long. Uh, they shouldn't be complete sentences or anything like that. I'll be modeling in these broadcasts the type of notes that I would take. Um, I may make them a little bit fuller, you know, in terms of the words that go in there, um, just so that they are a little bit more understandable and legible to you, but it'll give you a rough idea of what you can do. Um, your own mileage may vary, uh, because of course some people, um, reading comprehension is one of the, one of the areas where they struggle. Uh, I will say it is worth your time to spend the time to understand the passage well the first time through. You don't know how many questions you're going to get. You may only get three questions, and then you'll say, oh, darn, you know, I spent all that time on that one passage. On the other hand, you could get five questions, and um, the better you understand the passage the first time, the less you'll, the less you'll have to go back and read elements of the passage again. The reason this is important is, is is if you get five questions or, you know, some of these reading comprehension passages, let's see, today we're going to do one that has three, one that has four, one that has, I guess we're doing three, four, and three, but then um, depending on how fast we go, there's another one um, coming up that has six questions on it. And, you know, uh, you know, it can vary quite a bit what you'll get on the actual exam. Um, but if you actually have to go back and read significant parts of the passage because you skimmed the first time through, if you have to go back and read bits thoroughly for six questions, um, that's a lot of time. <clears throat> Excuse me, that's a lot of time lost. You are actually just better off understanding it and being able to move quickly through the questions. So, also because of copyright, you know that this uh, the uh, the official guide to the test is uh, you know copyright uh, the. Uh, Graduate Management Admissions Council, it's not like I can just put the passage or the, the entire answers um, up on the screen for you. So I will probably abbreviate what some of the answers are to keep them clear and make notes on what um, distinguishes them while during the time that you are, because I'm going to give you some time to read each of the passages. So that's kind of my, my preview, and if it turns out that this just isn't working the way that I'm doing it in particular, um, or if you have suggestions, of course, you can uh, comment on the Facebook page that um, launches these um, uh, broadcasts. And 
uh, those will get to me eventually, and if I finish early, I'll check them at the end of the session. So, uh, without going on too much longer, just about reading comprehension in general, let's get started. So, page 358, question um, number one. So I'll give uh, at least four minutes to um, read the passage, uh, take notes. I too will be taking notes, and then um, then we'll talk about it. Starting now. Okay, that's probably as good a place as any to stop. Uh, uh, of course, you can keep reading, and the other thing you can do, of course, is pause the broadcast and keep finishing reading. And I guess what I encourage you to do, no, not I guess, what I encourage you to do, I guess I should have said this in the, um, the, the, the initial kind of preface, is that when you're first starting reading comprehension, or really any question type, um, it is in your best interest to do your your book practice, you know, from the official guide or from, um, you know, some other provider of test prep, 
Um, I'm, I'm a big fan of doing untimed practice as well as timed practice so that you can have the experience of finding the clues that you need to get the questions right in an untimed environment and get faster at it that way and then apply those skills when you take full length practice timed exams. Does that make sense? I, you, I can't see you nodding even if, even if it does make sense uh, or doesn't. Um, the idea being that you both practice doing things the right way and practice things doing things quickly and that you don't work on those skills at the same time, at least not initially. Or, I mean, of course, you, you do your untimed practice and you learn how to look for clues in the reading comprehension passage um, in the untimed practice, and you're still doing that in timed practice, but um, you, you see how those two meet. And as you practice these things untimed, you will get faster at them, and eventually the skills you learn in time management on the uh, timed practice will uh, also apply. So, you know, in the beginning, you might actually have to guess on a lot of questions on your timed practice, even though you're getting a lot of questions right in the untimed practice, and eventually your speed picks up on the one, and your strategy um, in terms of time management on the test becomes better on the other. Anyway, so in terms of untimed practice, if I finish, t um, you know, with the dead airtime um, talking about, or, you know, where you have a chance to read the passage, if I finish before you are finished, by all means, um, you know, pause the broadcast and, and finish reading and then listen to what I have to say. Because it is important that you give yourself enough time to understand everything that you have in front of you. So uh, we had a passage here about eco-efficiency. Um, the notes I took um, that it may be worse than non-eco-efficiency because businesses will just use the savings that they get in terms of production waste um, to spur more growth so that there are even more products being produced. Um, and so more growth, um, so the, the efficiency turns into more growth and that turns into more waste. Um, and then there's other information in there about um, how it could even be worse than a completely environmentally destructive, non-eco-efficient um, business. And, the, and then the, the author says that a new approach is, is needed. Um, or actually, not the author doesn't necessarily say it, the author cites two other authors who argue that a new approach is needed. The author, him or herself, may not necessarily agree with that. So, um, Question number one, the primary purpose of the passage. And so when it's primary purpose, this is about the main idea. I am a fan of when you finish a reading comprehension passage, ask yourself, it's not something you have to take notes on, ask yourself what the author was trying to accomplish. Um, if nothing else, did the author express his or her own opinion about what should happen? Or was the author merely reporting, um, explaining different processes, giving the history of something without actually applying judgment to it. So just knowing whether the author expressed an opinion uh, can help you eliminate wrong answer choices in um, primary purpose or main idea big picture questions. You won't always get a main idea question, but they're pretty common. So primary purpose of the passage, was it to explain why a particular business strategy has been less successful than it than was once anticipated? So, you know, on, on the answer choices here, I just wrote down the first words or phrases. A lot of times, the, the, those first words or phrases um, are enough information to eliminate the answer choices. Um, you know, in reading this, I don't feel like the author gave um, his or her opinion. The author just reported on eco-efficiency and what these two other authors have said about it. So we're going to want something like explain, propose, present, um, Make a case for and suggest uh, both imply that the author is trying to convince you of something. And so these are a little bit uh, suspicious just based on the initial words. We would still want to read the whole thing just to be sure. There would be some cases where the first word alone, though, would enable us to eliminate an answer choice. Anyway, the word explain starts out fine. Um, why a particular business strategy, we do talk about eco-efficiency, I guess that's a business strategy, has been less successful than was once anticipated. So there's nothing about the success of eco-efficiency and certainly nothing about its anticipated success. So I should probably do these in another color. Um, so we don't have anything about, um, so we have no success or um, anticipation going on. 
so it's not A. B, propose an alternative to a particular business strategy that has inadvertently caused ecological damage. Um, there is discussion of the potential of eco-efficiency to cause uh, economic damage, but, uh, but there's no inadvertent damage. Also, propose is, is again, kind of an author, um, author opinion. The author is suggesting something. And that isn't really what, what goes on here. Uh, C, present a concern about the possible consequences of pursuing a particular business strategy. So eco-efficiency is the business strategy. Present a concern. So a concern is presented, namely that it could be worse. That's what I wrote over in our notes here. Eco-efficiency may be worse. Let's hold on to C and just double check the other ones. Um, choice D, make a case for applying a particular business strategy. That's our eco-efficiency. Um, on a larger scale than is currently practiced. If anything, this is 180 degree opposite of what the passage ultimately um, arrives at, which is that eco-efficiency, as it's currently practiced, in fact is worse, and applying it on a larger scale um, may actually be worse than not doing eco-efficiency at all. So definitely not D. Uh, choice E, suggest several possible outcomes and we can actually just stop there. We didn't have several possible outcomes, but the whole thing says several possible outcomes of companies' failure to understand the economic impact of a particular business strategy. We also don't have anything about economic impact. There's too many things where I'm not even going to write what's wrong with this one. This is terrible. Um, so that leaves us with answer choice C for number one, namely that uh, presenting a concern about the possible um, consequences. And so the advantage of this large initial time investment, oh, and I should have erased what I wrote instead of um, erasing the whole screen. Okay, well, that means we go without the notes on question uh, one, two, and three. So question two, um, I'm not going to write down little phrases for this one because they look uh, awfully similar. So we'll just go through them one by one, and I'll make notes about what's relevant. Um, the passage mentions which of the following is a possible consequence of companies' realization of greater profits through eco-efficiency. So um, the greater profits part um, comes in in line 17, where it says greater profits may be turned into investment capital that could easily be reinvested in old-style eco-inefficient industries. So we're looking for something like that. This is what's uh, called a detail question or... Um, uh, what's another word for it? Details or like ideas from the passage. I forget what they what they also call it. Um, anyway, uh, this is something that actually appears in the passage that, as opposed to an inference which doesn't actually appear in the passage. So uh, <clears throat> we're looking for something like the uh, investment in non-eco-efficient industries. Choice A, the companies may be able to sell a greater number of products by lowering prices. The idea that companies could sell more products is a consequence listed later in the passage, but lower prices are never mentioned. So here I'm writing down lower prices as the reason it's not A. Um, B, the companies may be better able to attract investment capital in the global market. There's nothing about attracting investment, um, nor is there anything about the global market. So it's not B. C, the profits may be reinvested. OK, that sounds good. Uh, to increase economic growth through eco-efficiency. Well, that's possible. Um, and it's something that men gets mentioned later that this could be have kind of a snowball effect. But it's not specifically the part talked about uh, by the in the section of line 17 about increased profits. So there is no reinvest in eco-efficiency. Let's not see. The profits may be used as investment capital for industries that are not eco-efficient. So that sounds exactly like what we predicted, and it almost certainly is that. In fact, I'll just give it away. It is that answer choice, um, but let's just see what's wrong with E. Uh, one of the other points of doing untimed practice is seeing how wrong answer choices are constructed so that you can more easily recognize them or more easily learn the patterns of wrong answer choices when you face them in a timed environment. It, it speeds your process of elimination. 
So choice E, the profits may encourage companies to make further innovations in reducing production waste. Uh, we don't have anything about further innovations. So it's not E, it is in fact answer choice D. And now that I've deleted my notes, there's no reason not to delete each of these. Actually, and so sometimes actually the, the very act of writing those notes on a passage is you've done all the good that you need to do with that. Um, the, um, the act of writing notes helps encode things better in your brain. So, um, you know, you don't necessarily have to refer back to your notes in order to get the questions right. Anyway, question number three. The passage implies which of the following is a possible consequence of a company's adoption of innovations that, incre that increase its eco-efficiency. So the passage implies makes this an inference question, which means that the correct answer will be something that is not, ex not stated explicitly in the passage, but um, is almost stated explicitly, to the point where um, you probably thought that the passage said that, um, even though it didn't. So that's so the inference questions and in reading comprehension are um, usually very small logical leaps. Well, they're always very small logical leaps, um, and often they are very concentrated in a particular part of the passage where it's something that you you simply understood as a reader without it being stated by the passage. So that makes it a little bit trickier to find them because they're things that aren't actually stated. Let's see if we can find one that looks likely. Um, we did find out the company's adoption of innovations that increase in, um, eco efficiency. Um, that was up in line um, six or five through um, five through fourteen. <laughs> it's a big chunk of the passage where we find out about how um, companies will use eco efficiency to spur growth. And that's not necessarily a good thing for all things, all other things eco. So something like that in our answer choices. Um, answer choice A, a company profits resulting from such innovations may be reinvested in that company with no guarantee that the company will continue to make further improvements in eco efficiency. So it starts out great. You know, they do talk about reinvesting in the company or you know, that, that the money can go towards other things, but it goes towards growth in the passage rather than towards um, things that are not eco-efficient. So, this whole reinvesting in non-eco-efficient things, that's not really what we're after. Uh, B, company growth fostered by cost savings from such innovations may allow that company to manufacture a greater number of products that will be used and discarded, thus worsening environmental stress. Um, and actually, that's very like what the passage says. It says, such innovations reduce production waste, but do not alter the number of products manufactured nor the waste generated from their use and discard. Indeed, most companies invest in eco-efficiency improvements in order to increase profits and growth. So choice B sounds really good. Let's check the other ones, though. Especially with inference questions, you really do want to read all of the answer choices, uh, just to be sure. And inference questions are one of the more Potentially, well, detailed inference questions are the two most common question types you are likely to run into on GMAT reading comprehension because they can give multiples of them from any given passage. They'll only ask you the main idea once. They'll probably only ask you an application question, which we'll get one later. They only get you one of those once, um, but um, they may give you more than one detail and inference. Anyway, answer choice C. A company that fails to realize significant cost savings from such innovations may have little incentive to continue to minimize the environmental impact of its production processes. It's processes, not processes, even though you hear people say that, they're wrong. Um, it's only Greek nouns that end in SIS, like basis or crisis. Crisis that goes to crises. So when people say processes, they're naughty. Anyway, that's an aside. Uh, answer choice C, way off. Um, we don't find out anything about companies failing to realize significant savings um, or incentive that they have to keep doing things. So this is, um, there's basically nothing about companies failing to be eco-efficient. The, the, the passage is all about what, what are the bad things that happen when companies are successfully eco-efficient. So there's no failure. It's not C. Uh, D, a company that comes to depend on such innovations to increase its profits and growth may be vulnerable in the global market to competition from old-style eco-inefficient industries. 
Um, that may be true, but this is one of those cases where they uh, may well be, um, depending on these on those business brains of yours out there, um, to you know like when you're thinking about business and global markets, that's actually a common trap in both critical reasoning and reading comprehension. They they rely on your outside business knowledge to give you things that sound attractive and may even be true, but are not supported at all by the passage. We don't hear anything about competition between eco-efficient industries and non-eco-efficient industries. So um, nothing like that. And then E, a company that meets its eco-efficiency goals is unlikely to invest its increased profits in the development of new and innovative eco-efficiency measures. There's nothing about the likelihood of reinvestment. So that's not it either. So B, the one that sounded so awesome and so like the passage before is in fact our correct answer. Okay, let's move on to our next passage, which is relatively short. I'll give you another, you know, like I said, four minutes or so to read this one, and we'll go from there. So this is page 360, question four, and I'll take some notes.
Okay, that's probably enough of that. Um, it's a relatively short passage. It's just relatively detailed in the stuff it has. In terms of the notes I took, the, the first uh, paragraph just talks about how there's more tooth breakage in the Pleistocene era than there was now. Um, then they discuss why this is. And in my note taking, um, you know, you can kind of see that I kept the vertical alignment here. I used that to remember that it was not preservational bias. It was not local bias. Um, and then related ideas, I just kind of indent. Um, behavioral exc exclamation point here represents the idea that that is what their solution was. And then that they eat down to the bone, and that's because of less prey and more predators. So use whatever methods you want to keep your information straight. Um, indentation and other types of nonverbal cues can make your notes uh, more brief. You can also... <laughs> I'm a big fan of, you know, if, if somebody disagrees with something or something's wrong, I'll do a frowny face, or if they agree, it's a smiley face. I could have just as easily done that here. Anyway, you get the idea. Uh, whatever whatever works for you. And so, you know, don't don't judge me too harshly about how I how I do my notes because your mileage may vary considerably and you may do some pretty silly things if you take notes. Anyway, question number three, or excuse me, question number four. Uh, the primary purpose of the passage is to, and so primary purpose, did the authors give their opinion, or did the author give his or her opinion? The author explained what experts in the field um, think about this strange um, information about tooth breakage, so, um, and what that might mean, and then gives what the experts generally think it is, but um, it doesn't advocate a particular course of action. So primary purpose. Was the primary purpose to present several explanations for a well-known fact? Well, um, I don't think it's a well-known fact. The first three words of the, um, of the passage are a recent study. So this is really just some recent findings, and they're trying to figure out what's going on with those recent findings. So while there are several explanations that are discussed, um, namely, you know, that it's demographic, preservational, or local, um, it's, not, it's not really a well-known fact at all, so it can't really be a... you eliminate it because of this whole well-known fact thing. Choice B, suggest alternative methods for resolving a debate. There's no debate. They just found some, found some facts and they're looking for a cause. There aren't two sides, two or more sides to the debate. There's no debate at all. Uh, C, argue in favor. Well, and that's already uh, trouble. The passage isn't really arguing anything. Uh, it's more kind of explaining. Argue in favor of a controversial theory. Yikes. That's totally not it. Uh, D, question the methodology used in a study. Methodology is the way they went about doing something, you know, if they used methods that were statistically inaccurate or, you know, didn't wash their hands or something, I don't know, I don't know what it would be and didn't, didn't properly handle the, um, the physical evidence or something, those, that would be questioning the methodology. Just looking for different explanations for something is not questioning the methodology. And then choice E, discuss the implications of a research finding. So the research finding is the first paragraph. The implications of that, namely what it suggests about what was going on is what's discussed in the second paragraph. So it's definitely answer choice E. And given all the scribbling that I did, I think we are just going to have to move to not erasing and just losing the notes. If you want to go back and look at the notes, you can, uh, when you review this later, you can pause the broadcast and go back and look at my amazing note-taking skills. So page 360, question number five. I guess we have five questions on this here. So according to the passage, compared with Pleistocene carnivores in other areas, Pleistocene carnivores in the La Brea area, um, and so talking about different areas, that was the section on local bias, which was um, lines 17 through 19. They ruled out local bias because breakage data obtained from other Pleistocene sites were similar to the La Brea data. So we want something about how they're the same. Um, choice A, included the same species in approximately the same proportions. Well, we don't have, we don't have, uh, 
have proportions and species that's way beyond what we have. Uh, choice B had similar frequency of tooth fractures. Um, and that's exactly what we had. They ruled out local bias because, because breakage data was the same. So B is exactly what we were looking for just to cover C, D, and E. Um, choice C populated the La Brea area more densely. Ba all the way at the end of the passage, we do find, about, find out about um, there being more dense predation, more, more dense population of predators. But that's not in the section about um, Pleistocene carnivores in the La Brea area compared to um, other places. And um, La Brea just means the tar in Spanish. So the La Brea tar pits are the the tar tar pits if you um, include both languages translated into English. That's funny to me. Anyway, um, so choice C, um, densely, that's later in the passage. That's like line 29. It's not that. Uh, choice D, consumed their prey more thoroughly. That also does get covered, um, but again, that's in, an, that's in the part explaining why there may be these, these greater, greater number of tooth fractures. So that's like line 23, not the section on local, local bias or the, you know, La Brea carnivores versus other Pleistocene carnivores. And then choice E, found it harder to obtain sufficient prey. Again, this is something that happens in the passage, and so there, here's a classic example of how they construct wrong answer choices for detail questions. They will give you other real things that happen in the passage, just not in the part that you're looking for. So this is where skimming is particularly deadly, or that's where these wrong answer choices are particularly deadly for skimmers, because um, they will be totally things that you just read, and they will catch your eye if you go back and skim the passage for the answers. Um, in this case, we will, have th we will have had three answer choices, all of which are things that happen in the passage. You would have to go back and basically read the whole passage anyway. Skimming saves you no time, and in fact, you spent more time because you both skimmed and then had to go back and read more carefully to eliminate these three answer choices. So choice uh, E, um, the sufficient prey thing, um, that's like line 26 to 27. So again, skimming is bad. It causes you to waste a lot of time and spend more time on individual questions and potentially more time just reading the passage. Choice B it is for question five. So 360, question number six. According to the passage, the researchers believe that the high frequency of tooth breakage in carnivores found at La Brea was caused primarily by. So where we found out about that was later in the passage. Um, that was starting with line 19. The explanation they consider most plausible is behavioral. And this is where we find out that basically the predators are munching on their meals all the way down to the bones. And by chewing on the bones, they are more likely to break their teeth. So we want something like that. Answer choice A, the aging process in individual carnivores. So the aging process does get mentioned, but that's in dismissing... Um, the demographic, uh, demographic bias. So the age thing, that's lines 11 to 13. You can already see, again, they're giving you things that appear elsewhere in the passage in the wrong section. Choice B, contact between the fossils in the pits. That's the preservational bias. Should be an S. And uh, that's lines 13 to 16, the very next bit. Um, poor preservation of the fossils after they were removed from the pits. Um, that just <laughs> doesn't happen at all in the passage. I mean, that, that is something that can happen. Fossils can be poorly preserved, especially if they were stored in some other type of environment, like under the sea or in a desert or in a tar pit. And then once they're exposed to the air, other things happen. But that's, not, that's outside knowledge. That's not what's going on in the passage. It's not supported. Choice D, the impact of carnivores' teeth against the bones of their prey. That's exactly what we predicted and exactly what the passage says, so it's going to be D. Choice E, though, the impact of carnivores' teeth against the bones of other carnivores during fights over kills. So that's an inference that you could make, perhaps, that if the, if, if the reason for munching all the way down to the bone is because there's way more predators than uh, prey, yeah, maybe they are fighting, but that's an inference, whereas this one, we're just looking for what the passage actually says. 
And the passage says they are just eating carcasses too thoroughly. So it's answer choice D for question number six. On to the next page, page 361, question number seven. The researcher's conclusion concerning the absence of demographic bias would be most seriously undermined if it were found that. So this is a weakened question. We want to go back to the passage and see where we find out about demographic bias. Demographic bias, um, basically it starts in um, line 11, and there we find out that they eliminated it because the older specimens, the, the fossils that were for older individuals, didn't have more tooth breakage than um, younger ones. So uh, the amount of tooth breakage was not a function of age according to the evidence that they found. So we would, to weaken it, we need to undermine the evidence that they found that says older, um, you know, older, older specimens didn't have any more tooth breakage. Uh, choice A, the older an individual carnivore is, the more likely it is to have a large number of tooth fractures. So that's actually 180, the opposite of what um, would undermine it. That actually strengthens, um, or excuse me, that that doesn't, um, it strengthens their original, um, the, what it, it strengthens what would have been um, the uh, pr uh, not preservational, demographic bias. Um, but instead, um, this is actually the very idea that the evidence disproves. And so just saying that that's true, and so that might be true in general. And since the evidence says the opposite of that, um, it strengthens the, the researcher's theory that the tooth breakage in this particular case is not caused by age. So it's not A. B, the average age at death of a present day carnivore is greater than the average age at death of a Pleistocene carnivore. Probably true, life was not that pleasant in the Pleistocene, um, but the modern ones are irrelevant. This is all about back then. Choice C, in Pleistocene carnivore species, older individuals consumed carcasses as thoroughly as did younger individuals. Again, we're looking for something that weakens the idea that, um, that, it's, that there's demographic bias, and if they do... Um, uh, if this if this says that they are the same, this further um, strengthens the researcher's thesis. Um, D, the methods used to determine animals' ages in fossil samples tend to misidentify many older individuals as younger individuals. So this actually weakens the evidence that they were using to uh, support their point about the um, demographic data. If the ones that they thought were older that had the same number of tooth fractures as the younger ones were actually also younger ones. It could actually be that those few statistical outliers that they had that had more tooth fractures were actually the older ones. D sounds really good. Choice E, uh, data concerning the ages of fossil samples cannot provide reliable information about behavioral differences between extinct carnivores and present day carnivores. Again, the modern stuff, while interesting and um, potentially true, um, is not relevant to the question of the demographic um, demographic bias. So it's not um, it's not it's not E. It's answer choice D, uh, which directly goes after the evidence that was used to support um, their elimination of demographic bias. Okay, last one. It turns out that my initial speech about reading comprehension. Um, is going to have delayed us and we are not going to get through all the questions that I thought we were going to get through today. So sorry about that. Anyway, uh, page uh, 361, question number eight. According to the passage, if the researchers had not found that two extinct carnivore species were free of tooth breakage, the researchers would have concluded that. So we have to go back, and so according to the passage, it's a detail question, which means the information we're after is in the passage, stated there in black and white. Um, and so the part where we hear about uh, two species that were free of tooth breakage is in the preservational bias sentence, which is line uh, 13. They rejected preservational bias because a total absence of breakage in two extinct species demonstrated that the fractures were not the result of abrasion within the pits. And of course, those species don't need to have been carnivores. They could have been other things. Um, 
but basically teeth weren't teeth on fossils or on specimens were not breaking because they were getting ground around in in slow moving tar currents or something like that so it, uh, if they had not found that that would have weakened their their elimination of pres of the preservational bias in explaining why there was all this tooth breakage right so answer choice a um, so if they had not found the, those free of tooth breakage, they would have concluded that, and then these are our answer choices, A, the difference in breakage frequencies could have been the result of damage to the fossil remains in the La Brea tar pits, in the, the tartar pits. Um, yes, so that's exactly what we were just talking about, that um, the two species without to tooth breakage um, were used to support the idea that it wasn't the tar pits breaking the teeth. Um, the researchers would have had to conclude, would have had to have concluded that the tar pits could have been the things doing the breakage if they didn't have the two species without the tooth breakage. So choice A sounds awesome, but let's keep reading. Uh, choice B, the fossils in other Pleistocene sites could have higher break could have higher breakage frequencies than do the fossils in the La Brea tar pits. Um, this was again, this is something that appeared in the passage. This was the locational bias which they did eliminate, but they didn't eliminate it based on these two species in the pits without tooth breakage. They used um, other data to eliminate this one. So this is one of those trap answer choices where it's something that appears in the passage but is not actually um, in the part that we're after. Uh, choice C, Pleistocene carnivore species probably behaved very similarly to one another with respect to consumption of carcasses. So this is kind of related to the behavioral solution or the behavioral uh, theory for why there's all this tooth breakage. Um, and does it actually say that they... No, it doesn't actually talk about the Pleistocene carnivores behaving similarly. So um, the whole similarly thing is also questionable on answer choice C. Uh, D, all Pleistocene carnivore species differed behaviorally from present-day carnivores. Again, this is addressing the wrong uh, type of explanation or the wrong type of um, bias. Also, uh, we have no reason to believe that they all behave differently. You may sometimes hear that um, extreme answer choices in both critical reasoning and reading comprehension are oftentimes wrong and it does really depend on the nature of the question but anytime they talk about all of something every single one every time definitely be a little bit suspicious it does hinge on the nature of the question and sometimes those will be right um, particularly when you're trying to weaken uh, something actually um, they can be right but uh, in general be suspicious of very um, strong language like all of this or none of these but it's also wrong because of the behavioral thing and it's not supported in the passage that all of the carnivores behaved in a certain way especially because how could they possibly know uh, and anyway choice e predator densities during the pleistocene era were extremely high so this is something that gets mentioned as a potential reason for the behavioral explanation um, namely that um, they may have been going down to the bone because there was more competition for food and so they had to get every last bit because there was more predator density. But the two species with no tooth breakage um, had nothing to do with supporting that idea. So this is again kind of a subset of the behavioral section of the passage. So it's not D and it's not E. It is in fact A which sounded exactly like what we were hoping for anyway. Okay, so um, I, you know, if it weren't for the fact that I have to give you some time to read the passage, and the one on the next page is actually kind of long, it's uh, six paragraphs long, and I just don't see myself, even though there's only three, pa only three questions, um, we only have about nine more minutes, and so that would give me about a minute per question. It would give me as much time to talk about a question as you should 
um, normally be spending answering a question where you don't have to do it out loud. So I think I'm going to stop here. I am just going to briefly check the uh, Facebook page to see if anybody has any questions. You never know, right? So I'm going to check that broadcast page. It's exciting because it's live. All right. And I'm not going to play the uh, the video of me talking. I don't actually care what I'm well. I care what I'm saying, but I don't need to hear it. Um, nope, nothing today. Okay, that is a okay with me. Uh, so I think we'll just end um, eight minutes early. Next time we will pick up with um, the longer passage that starts on page three sixty two, and. Um, my hope is that we'll catch up to where we were supposed to be for this time. But if not, we will just I think we'll just have to readjust the published numbers. I'm not going to have to give that long speech about reading comprehension, so I think it'll be OK. Anyway, thanks for joining me. Uh, my name's Jim Jacobson. I'll just refresh your memory here. My name's Jim Jacobson. You've been listening to me talk about reading comprehension today on the um, Crockett's OG TV. That's us here at Crockett. And this is the 12th edition to the guide to the test. And we are going question by question. And right now we're going through reading comprehension. So uh, hope to see you next time. And uh, in the meantime, have a good day.